All right. Good morning, everybody, and thanks for coming. Uh, this is our second uh, talk for this semester. Actually, a talk. And um, so, first of all, I really want to thank Dr. May for taking his time to come over here. Actually, she drove. I mean, he drove here yesterday and gave us this talk. And thank you very much. Mm. So, um, and also, I'm so happy to have him over here and kind of like uh, introduce him to all of you. And so currently, Dr. May is a professor and also a chair of the Department of Neuroscience at Case Western Reserve University. He is also a director of the Cleveland Brain Initiative. And with regard, with regard his like, education background, so he did his medical training in China back in 1980. Two, and uh, from Jiangxi Medical College. Then he received his master degree uh, from pharmacology, the Institute of Pharmacology and Toxicology from Beijing. And then he pursued the, the PhD in the University of Arizona. And he received his PhD degree in 1989. I think it's 89. And then he did his postdoc training in the University of, I mean, in John Hopkins Hospital, actually, in John Hopkins John Hospital. So um, he has been um, very successful in his area and busy. So as you can see from his CV, he has like um, published over 160 papers, and most of them are in the high impact journals. And he also won like many research awards, and he's also inventor for many patents for his like a scientific or research discoveries. And um, in addition to his successful research, he also serves in like the various national and international societies and committees. He sits in many NIH study sections, reviewing grants, and also on editorial board for many journals. And uh, so his the research in Dr. May's lab has focused on the mechanisms of the synapse formation, neuron transmission, and also the synaptic plasticity. Mm, so their study actually contributes to a better understanding of how this process, I mean, how this process and also contribute to, uh, like, um, to find the potential therapeutic strategies for the neurological disorders and also the psychiatric disorders. So anyway, there are so many good things going on with him, and uh, I think uh, it's better to save time for his interesting talk. And thank you very much, and welcome. Thank you. Um, well, thanks very much for the introduction. Thank very nice. Coming. And uh, and the opportunity to tell you what we do. Uh, it's, does the mic work okay? I never give a talk with the two wires. Um, okay, so um, it was a very nice drive yesterday. The weather was very nice, but it's a little bit longer than I thought. You know, Google only says three hours, but it took about four hours. Um, Anyway, so I'm going to tell you two lines of research that's happening in my lab. So one is more about uh, a peripheral synapse called the neuromuscular junction. And the other one is uh, um, more about the brain. So no, you know in the brain there are billions of neurons. And every neuron would make connections to uh, thousands of other neurons, and through this uh, fundamental anatomical unit called uh, synapses, where a presynaptic terminal will contact a postsynaptic target, and where the neurotransmitter receptors will be released upon arrival of action potential, and then initiate postsynaptic currents, and thus activate or inhibit at the postsynaptic target. And this target in the brain could be another neuron. In the peripheral 
in the peripheral uh, organs and could be skeletal muscle, smooth muscle, salivary gland, uh, you name it. So uh, my lab has been using uh, two models to, to study neural, uh, to study how synapses are formed and how they adapt to the environment and what goes on in under disease conditions. So if you look at the synapses of neurons in the brain. So here shows two. Uh, you know, the, uh, the green color indicates excitatory neuron, where you have a lot of intrusions, and each one of them represent a postsynaptic structure. Okay? And this red color neuron indicates an inhibitory neuron that uses GABA as a neural transmitter that inhibit pyramidal neurons, and that's critical for EI balance. So as you look at this, and so how could, what are the, or what are the molecular mechanisms that control the synapse formation? And is there any mechanism that controls the location of the synapses or the number of the synapses? So studying of CNS neurons and will be very difficult in addressing uh, these questions. So um, my lab, I just alluded earlier, we use neuromuscular junction to study how synapses form and try to answer some of the fundamental questions uh, in synaptogenesis. And, and that will be first part of my talk. And the second part, I will tell you a story that was recently, recently developed uh, on a, uh, uh, one form of attention. So neuromuscular junction is a peripheral synapse that's formed between motor neurons in the spinal cord and the skeletal muscle. It's fundamental to the control of your uh, muscle uh, contractile force. Even you sit still, your muscles are still you know, uh, 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 contracting and to, for your posture. So neuromuscular junction uh, it's always localized in the middle of the muscle fiber. So this shows the diaphragm and only half of it. And the other half, it's not shown. Here's the central cavity. The phrenic nerve that would travel in the middle of the muscle fiber send out numer numerous secondary uh, branches that would dive into the muscle fiber to form the, or to induce a acetylcholine receptor cluster. That's on the postsynaptic side. So nerve stained in green, uh, the acetylcholine receptor clusters are stained using alpha bungal toxin, rhodamine conjugated, that's in red. So this tiny area occupies less than 0.1% of the entire muscle fiber. One uh, immature uh, form is only one NMJ uh, per muscle fiber, and the acetylcholine receptor are uh, extremely highly concentrated uh, at this spot. It's about 10,000 receptors per square of micron. So this is an EM. This is a scanning EM. This is a transmission EM. You can see the terminal has a lot of vesicles. And they actually docked at a, a kind of a active zone and facing the uh, synaptic uh, junctional fold. And the receptors are extremely highly concentrated at the top of this uh, so-called the junctional fold, and on this part is the, uh, the um, muscle fiber. So my lab and many other labs are interested in how this complex structure is formed and how they develop, uh, how they are developed or adapt in diseases. So if, you, if we take one step back, and we, you, we know the muscle fibers actually form uh, before the receptor clusters or before nerve-induced clusters are actually formed. So uh, prior to the nerve arrival, uh, muscle fibers form some kind of a primitive receptor clusters indicated by this line, the red line. A nerve will come in, induce larger clusters. Sometimes one large cluster may be multiple innervated, but eventually the large clusters will become perforated and one motor neuron terminal would only innovate one uh, cluster and then one neuromuscular junction. Okay, so this is adult form. 
And in aged uh, animals, an NMJ will fall apart. An NMJ will also fall apart in muscular dystrophy and ALS, which I'll come back to this later. So we are a molecular um, biologist or well, neuroscientist. So we try to understand how muscles and nerves interact. So uh, for, uh, for this signaling pathway coming from motor neuron to the muscle, we call this anthrograde. And for this, we call, for muscle to the uh, motor nerve, we call that uh, and, uh, the retrograde. Okay, so uh, we know more about this anthrograde signaling pathway than this retrograde signaling pathway. In my lab and many other labs have shown that perhaps beta catenin or wind signaling may be important for retrograde signaling. And muscles may be known to um, release some trophy factors and for presynaptic differentiation. But I'm not going to talk about this uh, in today's talk. Uh, we're going to only focus on this uh, anterograde signaling. And that's pretty much the agrin signaling pathway. So Jack McMahon's lab and, and his colleagues and have uh, provided profounding evidence this agrin signaling uh, pathway uh, important for NMJ formation. So agrin is a proteoglycan. It's about 200 kilodalton used by motor neurons for uh, NMJ formation. So if you knock out agrin specifically in motor neurons, there's no NMJ. And there is a receptor tyrosine kinase called a MUSK. And when you knock out this, and there's no NMJ either. Okay, so mice will die immediately after birth because they cannot uh, breathe or, or suck milk. Uh, so, but in the field, and there were kind of a, a glaring gap in understanding how agrin talk to MUSK because these two molecules do not interact. And people have been looking for this in the uh, late 90s and even, uh, well, as, uh, as late as uh, 2006. And, and there are several molecules being identified, uh, half dozen of them, and they could interact with agrin, but none of them actually are bona fide the receptor. Because if they are true receptor, and when you mutate them, in mice, the mice should duplicate agrin or musk uh, phenotype, meaning they don't form neuromuscular junction. Uh, contrary, when you mutate all of, or one of them individually, the uh, uh, NMJ continue to form. So uh, the problem uh, was not solved by a by neuroscientist. Actually, it's solved by uh, a group of scientists uh, interested in bone formation. And so uh, the Scott Weatherby and Lee Nice Winders lab at the University of Colorado in Denver, so they were interested in bone formation. So they generated a library of mice and with the looking for phenotypes of this digit development. This is four limb and high limb. You can see when this molecule is mutated, and the digit formation has a problem. And they say, OK, by the way, the mice actually immediately die after birth and with uninflated lung. And you know, the, in my lab or in many labs who study neuromuscular junction, the immediate death after birth is good news for us. Okay? Unlike many of you who want to study live animals, we wish our mice would die immediately after birth, which would indicate uh, critical role for NMJ formation. Indeed, they reported that, you know, so this is a wire type. You see the nerve, you see the cluster. In the mutant, uh, you have the nerve, but you don't have the receptor cluster. So what is the ARP4? So ARP4 belongs to LDL receptor uh, family. And it's a single transmembrane domain protein, has various motifs. Uh, four beta propeller domains, LDLA uh, repeats and few EGF-like uh, 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 domains 
uh, in between of these um, uh, motifs. So uh, now families of members of this family are known to serve as a co-receptor of uh, various ligands. For example, LP5 and 6 are known to be a win uh, co-receptor. And so we wondered whether this could be the missing uh, link uh, in uh, aggregate signaling pathway. So indeed, Bing uh, then, uh, when he was in the lab, and he actually found that LP4 can interact uh, with aggregate, and at the same time, LP4 can also interact with the musk, but aggregate will increase LP4 musk interaction. And it, he also was able to show that LP4 is necessary and sufficient to reconstitute the, uh, the ability for aggregate uh, to activate uh, this musk in a non-muscle cell, providing evidence perhaps that LP4 is the only missing component uh, in this receptor complex. And this hypothesis was further uh, supported by our crystal analysis in collaboration with Ronson Genes Lab at UC Irvine, and we mapped the domain of um, uh, agrin uh, interacting for ARP4, and that requires this uh, C uh, terminal uh, domain. And then, uh, can people hear me all right? Because I noticed uh, some kind of a reduction. And, and also in ARP4, this first beta uh, propeller domain is absolutely uh, necessary. And then when you uh, crystallize these two minimum domains, and they form a very nice complex. In particular, this complex formation requires a neuronal agrin specific uh, insert and due to splicing. So agrin has two isoforms, and one is muscle isoform that's you know abundantly expressed in the muscle, but muscle isoform cannot induce acetylcholine receptor cluster. So when you mutate agrin in muscle, NMJ continues uh, to be formed. But in this neuronal isoform, there's a Z8 or uh, it's an eight amino acid insertion in the C terminus. And then, okay, so when you mutate, take this out, will completely wipe out uh, NMJ formation. So we found, and this Z8, in fact, are absolutely essential for agrin to interact with the ARP4 and to form a stable complex. Without that, you know, the complex cannot form, the signaling pathway uh, will be uh, compromised. So this uh, crystal analysis actually suggests a novel uh, activation mechanism of musk. Many of you know that the ligand binds to transmembrane receptor tyrosine kinases would induce its dimerization. Now we actually show that that agrin shown in green uh, in blue here would actually interact with ARP4 to form a heterodimer first, and two heterodimers would then interact to form a tetramer, and this tetramer would then serve as a macromolecule ligand, if you will, and to activate uh, musk and thus initiate intracellular signaling pathways and for NMJ uh, formation. Now, if you have any questions, uh, please interrupt me, okay? So uh, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I feel completely okay uh, to be interrupted. Otherwise, I'm feeling... So in your model, yes. I apologize for interrupting. But no. So in your model, it appears that you need four agrin molecules to activate one receptor or two? Two. Okay. So, so in fact, aggregate will form, and this shows, aggregate, you know, have uh, aggregate times two. Okay. Form, uh, in fact, aggregate we show that in this uh, uh, crystal structure, I have to form a diamond, and then bring two molecules of ARP4, and then thus bring in two molecules of musk. Now, this is a theoretical, uh, com you know, like a hypothesis based on this minimum domain crystal structure. Okay. So right now we are trying to solve this gigantic complex by prior year. Okay. Any other questions?
Okay, so so we believe we have to solve this uh, problem. You know, add will bind to ALK4 and thus activate MOS and thus through the signaling pathways that leads to a receptor cluster. Where there are various signaling pathways that we proposed downstream of MUSK for the receptor cluster. Um, uh, I, I, I have a slide, but I didn't show. But in fact, probably more than a dozen. Uh, but I want to call your attention uh, for today's talk on this adapter protein uh, called uh, Rapsin. Okay, so this, this protein uh, is like PSP95, the excitatory synapsis, or Jeffrin in inhibitory synapses, and they are believed to interact with the neurotransmitter receptors and bridge them to cytoskeleton or microtubule, and thus anchor the receptors at the postsynaptic membrane. Okay, and, and this actually was a well accepted hypothesis uh, in, uh, in, in, in textbook. So uh, what is this protein? So this protein looks like this. It has uh, uh, seven uh, uh, TPR domains, one coil-coil domain and one ring domain. Uh, for a long, long time, this protein, rapsin, uh, you know, uh, has been thought has no enzymatic activity, simply function as adapter, okay? And thus interact with the acetylcholine receptor and through dystroglycan or alpha dystroglycan interact with the cytoskeleton uh, in the muscle. Okay? And, and when you knock out, there's no NMJ. For sure, it's downstream of the musk. Okay? But there is a problem. The problem was, if this hypothesis is correct, right, you would like to predict the beta dystroglycan mutant mice would duplicate the phenotype. And it does not. There were some problems with this mutant mice, but neuromuscular junction continues to form. And that would challenge this hypothesis that indeed this interaction may be modulatory, but not crucial for accurate synonymic pathway. But when you analyze the clinical data, you know, the rapsin has been, you know, it's vulnerable in various uh, muscular dystrophy uh, diseases. So in particular, in this congenital myasthenic syndrome uh, disease, rapsin mutations has been identified. Most of them are modulatory, except a few, including one when this ring domain is partially deleted, right? And still bursts may, be, uh, may happen. So that will suggest this ring domain is important. It's beta dystroglycan binding is not important. So what is important then? So uh, Lei Li in the lab, in fact, analyzed this ring domain structure okay, and found that it shows homology for this C3, H2, C3 motif with various E3 ligases. Okay? And this motif is conserved in rapsin across species. And many of you know the E3 ligase in general conjugate ubiquitin into proteins for degradation. And this would suggest perhaps rapsin may have some kind of enzymatic activity. Is that true or not? So they uh, went out to test. So he purified. So you know, this is, seems to be a simple assay. Uh, and, uh, but uh, in order to, to purify, uh, to, uh, to provide uh, evidence beyond reasonable doubt, you, you have to generate uh, wraps and proteins from bacteria. Okay? We don't want to use HEK293 cells, which may be contaminated with the other E3 ligases. Okay? So when he did it, he incubated E1, E2, and E3, okay? and which is the rapsin. And you could see there is ubiquitination going on, self-ubiquitination, and on rapsin, and this is very exciting for the first time demonstrating the ring domain of rapsin indeed is an enzyme. And this, it depends on this H, uh, C3H2 motif. And when you mutate a single amino acid residue, and it will wipe out this enzyme activity. So how about function? So there are two ways you could test the function. 
One way you do this in HEK293 cells, you transfect acetylcholine receptor. Without rapsin, they are rather evenly distributed, as you can see. Okay? And when you co-transfect the wild type rapsin, and they form this punctus, mimicking the receptor clustering. And these punctus, most of them are on the surface. And when you co-transfect this mutate or mutant rapsin, and they kind of return to this level, or the receptor clusters is compromised. So is that important or not? So we, uh, in vivo or not, so uh, we generated a single amino acid mutation of uh, mutant rapsin mouse, knocking, and you see the, uh, I told you, the ure eureka moment came uh, when the mice actually die immediately after birth. And I remember, you know, Lay called me when I was on way to Costco. I have to tell him that I have to stop. Uh, I was too excited. And, and in this mutant mice, uh, uh, the uh, rapsin is expressed. Okay? And this is law. You don't have rapsin. And, and, and but uh, the receptor clustering is completely gone. Okay? And this is law. Uh, of course, there's no uh, receptor clustering. So this would suggest you mutate a single amino acid residue, presumably by wiping out its enzymatic activity and prevented mice forming uh, nicotinic receptor clusters. So uh, I, I don't want to bore you with the uh, detailed chemical analysis, but we actually showed that the, this enzymatic activity of rapsin rather uh, catalyze a chemical reaction called natalation and adding NAD-A to acetylcholine receptor at the same site that's critical for acetylcholine receptor ubiquitination and thus prevented uh, protein degradation. And this might be a mechanism uh, for uh, the uh, receptor clustering uh, at the neuromuscular junction. And we have also evidence that this entire signaling pathway is not only necessary for the NMJ formation, but it's important uh, for its maintenance. And I will show you using one disease model that this pathway is critical uh, if you mess around and patient will develop uh, muscular dystrophy. So there are, I told you the, um, uh, the uh, this signaling pathway is vulnerable for congenital myasthenic syndrome, which means patient may have mutations in rapsin, in musk, in anguin. Now, uh, since our identification of uh, ARP4 is critical here, and mutations have been identified in uh, ARP4. So there's another muscular dystrophy disease called myasthenia gravis, and this is not a congenital is due to uh, acquired antibody protection uh, in patients. So patients would generate autoral antibodies against uh, acetylcholine receptor or against musk. But in these patients, there are 12% of them would have no antibody against either of these proteins. So these patients will come to the clinic and the doctor would tell them, you know, sorry, you have the muscle weakness, but we cannot give you a solid diagnosis, okay? Um, but, you know, a couple features of this uh, disease and affects a female more than male, and in particular has this fatigability, which means if you ask the patients to move more, to exercise more, the muscle weakness uh, will become uh, more severe. So in collaboration with the physician scientist, uh, we analyzed in this acetylcholine receptor antibody negative, musk antibody negative patient, and we found indeed that there are antibodies against ARP4. Okay? And possibly identifying a novel biomarker for diagnosis. Indeed, when you generate antibodies in mice, rats, or rabbits, and the mice all the animals will become um, uh, weak in muscle strength and they lose body weight, uh, etc. And their neuromuscular junction uh, will fall apart. So this is a classic wire type 
neuromuscular junction, we call this preso-like structure. You have the acetylcholine receptor clusters in red, nerve staining, nerve terminal stain in uh, green, and they nicely superimposed. So here, in, in animals, is they generate antibodies uh, that the, you see the receptor clusters are completely falling apart, and majority of it are not innovated. You see the nerve terminal innovation, it just don't cover uh, as much. So as I told you, the, there's a characteristic fatigability. So we could test that in our mouse model. So if you stimulate the muscles, let them to generate action potential, in wild type, you give the 10 stimulations, they give it this nice compound muscle action potential. And in, the, in, in mice that produces the antibody, you could see the, it's a frequency dependent reduction of this compound action potential. Okay? And this demonstrate or replicate the fatigability that's a characteristic of uh, uh, myasthenia gravis. So we believe these data and provide uh, strong evidence these antibodies, uh, in fact, are damaging the NMJ and may be a, causing cause, a causal factor for mass in the gravis. And, um, uh, and in fact, uh, the, uh, we also have identified antibodies against uh, Agrin uh, in addition to that against ARP4. Now, these antibodies have been used uh, in uh, the, the clinic uh, for diagnosis. Uh, but the problem for, for this study at the moment is uh, uh, we are probably the only one group that studies uh, uh, in the U.S., but a, there are several groups that have been uh, studying this, um, Japan, China, Germany, uh, and the various countries, uh, Greece, for example. Now, as you may notice, the prevalence rate of this antibody varies dramatically. And we found a 9.2% in German, 50% uh, in Japan, it's 2%. So possibly, we believe, well, either due to the ethnic group uh, variation or due to diagnosis. So we are collaborating with about 20-some centers in, uh, in the US try to figure out exactly and, and what happens to the patient using uniformed diagnostic criteria. And th these antibodies, in fact, are de could be detected in patients with you know, uh, ALS. And we have no idea uh, what this implication uh, will be. And of course, we are interested in the uh, uh, mechanisms of ALS uh, as well. Uh, well, uh, finally, uh, one point is uh, for aging. Uh, in fact, we have evidence that if, if this signaling pathway uh, is diminished, the, the, the uh, mice we will exhibit uh, phenotypes that reminiscent to uh, aged mice. And if you restore by overexpressing either musk or ARP4 or DOC7, uh, in fact, it can improve uh, uh, phenotypes. OK, so this concludes my NMJ part. Uh, if you have any question, please. Yes? Those antibodies that are to the different proteins in a patient, do you see multiple antibodies or just to one target? That's a very good question. Uh, so uh, you mean the epitope of these antibodies? Is that what you mean? Yeah. Yes. Sir. The, uh, the, there are. The dominant epitope that we could see is a beta-3 propeller domain, okay? which is the domain. So beta-1 propeller domain interact with agrin. Beta-3 propeller domain, at the moment, is believed to interact with the musk. Okay? So, it's, so we believe these antibodies, some of these antibodies uh, have to be careful. So uh, some of these antibodies act on the domains that interact with you know, uh, the musk, for example, and thus block the RP4 musk interaction, and thus damaging the signaling. But I have to say, most of these antibodies also have the ability to activate complement. 
right? So that part cannot be excluded either. So there, there must be some other proteins that are similar to your L, LP, right? Uh -huh. And do they cross-react with those antibodies? Oh, that's a, that's a very interesting question, but I don't think we could address that. You know, like, uh, where's the end? You know, there are a dozen LDL receptor family members will be, uh, will be challenging. Is there comorbidity with other diseases that might make sense? Like um, lipid um, diseases? Myosinia gravis itself, probably not. But I cannot tell. Okay, so uh, ARP4, let me, let me just uh, back up one step. This is a very good question. So ARP4 is not muscle specific at all. It's expressed in the brain, mostly in the astrocytes. It's also expressed in the bone. And, in, and we have evidence for both that it regulates ATP release from astrocytes in the brain. And in the bone, it's critical for bone morphogenesis. When you mutate it, the bones are not happy. Okay, so whether these antibodies may cause some problems or not, uh, we don't know. But we don't, in our mice, we don't, we have not seen, well, certainly for myosinia gravis mouse models, we have not seen bone phenotype. Okay, yes. Hey, um, does the uh, LRP4 biomarker, does it apply to presynaptic conditions like Lambert-Eating myasthenic syndrome? Uh -huh. Oh, LRP4 is a presynaptic or not? Right, oh, that's a very good question, in fact. Uh, LP4, so I did not uh, get into detail. So Steve Burden's lab and my lab both have evidence that the uh, motor neurons also um, uh, is regulated by LP4, right? So LP4, uh, if, you, if you imagine this is a synaptic uh, cleft, okay, the space between here and here, LP4 is, has like a two, thousand amino acids. So if it stretches out, it's almost able to touch the other side of this, the membrane, okay, which is the post uh, presynaptic side of the nerve terminal. In fact, we showed that when you mutate ARP4 specifically in muscle fiber, and the nerve terminal development has a problem. So the current hypothesis is that the you know, there could be one molecule on this and that regulate, you know, uh, nerve terminal uh, development. And whether this involved in long, you know, Guillaume Barre or Lambert Eaton, we don't know. But it's not, uh, I'm, I would not be surprised. <laughs> Uh, that's a good question, um, but we don't know because uh, our current IRB, you know, the human, you know, the study protocol, only allow us to collect serum from patient. We cannot touch the patient's muscle. Usually, the patient would not do biopsy because uh, it's more painful. You know, you give them, you just get the draw of blood. That's, yeah, we don't know. We cannot answer that question. Okay, so uh, attention. So now, you know, we live in a very crowded or noisy world. You know, people fixing the roof too. <laughs> so we have to really stay focused, okay? And uh, this was uh, prepared by a graduate student, you know, that uh, he wants me to focus on what? So attention, so what is attention? Attention, you know, there are two types of attention. One is a stream of thought, okay? So that's so-called the top-down attention. One is uh, kind of a bottom-up attention stimulated by the noise, you know, the visual stimuli, hearing, etc. That's bottom-up, okay? And attention is absolutely important for us to behave normally, to perceive the environment and make decisions. And attention is a common symptom of various disorders. ADHD, for example, schizophrenia, depression, and Alzheimer's disease. Okay, I'm gonna show you a video clip and of two team players. Each team has a three uh, players. 
white team and black team. So you pay attention. They will pass basketballs to their teammate. You pay attention on the number of ball passing of the white team only. Okay, and of course I will have a test, and that will tell me tell you how your. So how many times? <laughs> Anyone spotted a gorilla? How many? Wow. <laughs> Only very few. <laughs> Anyone spotted a curtain color change? And well, it changed from red to this yellowish. And the disappearing of a black team player. Okay? So, <laughs> for those of you who actually correctly counted the number of ball passing, and that's a clearly thought driven attention because I told you to, right? And that means your top down attention is very good. And for those of you who spot a gorilla, that means your bottom-up attention is very good. Both are important. If you did both correctly, then you're outstanding. But I was a little bit surprised. Only like a five-ish in the audience spot a gorilla. Usually it's about one-third would it spot a gorilla. OK, so uh, you know there are a few examples of so-called top-down attention. You know, if you feel hungry, you want to look for food, that's top-down attention. If you are not, but you see the McDonald's sign, you go there to eat, that's bottom-up attention. And for kids who grew up in the US, and this is a classic example of this top-down attention, but you don't need to pay attention to that, you need to listen to my talk. For this side, you know, this, you will spot this out immediately, that's top-down or bottom-up. Come on. This will be bottom-up attention, right? Because this is stimulated by this right away. Now for this, I have to tell you to look for this, and then otherwise you may find difficult to find it. OK, so the top-down attention is always thought to be controlled by prefrontal cortex. Okay, Bottom-up is certainly controlled by the sensory uh, or the cortices to control the sensory uh, processing. So we wanted to know whether a subcortical region, such as hippocampus, could control the top-down attention. And if it does, what's the molecular mechanism uh, for that? Okay. And so to do this, and Zubin Ten in the lab uh, established this five-choice uh, assay. And so the mouse will be trained to look, to identify one of the five holes that's randomly lit. Within a limited time, the mouse have to poke the hole and come back to the food dispenser to get the reward if the mouse poked the right hole. Right? If they poke the wrong hole, that would be an error, that would be a mistake. There's no food reward. And there will be five second timeout, which is like a black. This whole thing will be black. Okay? And they could poke the holes, you know, before the light shows up. That's premature. Or they could simply sit still and don't do anything. Okay. And next slide, I'll just show one example. You see there's a fruit pellet? 
and they will do this again. Now, okay, so they didn't get it, so there will be five second timeout. So, so as you as you uh, now this this is edited. Okay, it doesn't happen just sequentially. The mice actually quite smart. They figure this out. They they don't make too many uh, errors. Now, so you see the mice are wired. Okay, it has electrodes implanted in the brain. I'll tell you later in the next slide. So w the mice are food deprived. So they have to pay attention to which hole it's lit. Okay? And we analyzed neuronal activity, f uh, th three second segments immediately before the light comes up. Okay? So we believe this is the region the mi mice or time that, that the mice have to pay attention. And neuronal activity in this period may affect the attention level. OK, so what do we record? We record, obviously, we want to record uh, this hippocampus. And we will also want to record this region called the prefrontal cortex that controls the top-down attention. And we want to know whether the hippocampus actually would modulate the neuronal activity in the prefrontal cortex. So we use tetrodes, and that would enable us to measure the local field of potential, which is which is this red color indicates. Okay, so it's pretty messy, but you could use a Fourier transformation to convert them into different frequencies. Okay, we also measure neuronal firing in the prefrontal cortex. So we want to do two things, basically. The next slide will be complex, but I will try to explain here. So first of all, we want to know, if you measure a local field of potential in this region and in this region, you filter them, you, we want to know whether these two regions would synchronize. If they synchronize better, that would suggest these two regions may talk to each other in a better way. Right? We also want to know whether the firing of this region, how they synchronize or fall in the peaks of different uh, frequency of local field of potential in the prefrontal cortex. Uh, uh, sorry, in the hippocampus. Okay, so this just to show a couple examples. Now, if these two regions are completely synchronized, the coherence will be one. Okay. Now, so you see. They're not completely synchronized. Let's just pay attention uh, to one line, okay? One, this red line. Okay, so the synchronization rate at different frequencies varies, but at the best, they synchronize at the point A, so not a completely. And but importantly, however, if the mice is correct making the choice, they synchronize better. Okay, so that would suggest that these two regions will communicate in a better way when the mouse is made in attention. Okay. So we know the hippocampus, the ventral hippocampus, project to the prefrontal cortex. And this would suggest that perhaps the hippocampus activity controls the prefrontal cortex activity, or certainly modulates prefrontal cortex activity. Okay, so this also shows a similar way, and, and which is that the, the neuronal firing in the prefrontal cortex actually face locked with different frequencies of local field of potential. You don't need to memorize all these, but just, just want to tell you, if they synchronize better, they give you this repetitive uh, peak and trough-like curve. Okay? If they don't synchronize, better or, or they synchronize worse, this you know, peak and trough will disappear. Anyway, when they make a correct choice, they synchronize better. When they make wrong they choice, they synchronize um, poorly. OK, so, so what is the molecular mechanism? So my lab has been uh, studying so-called EI balance. And this slide you showed before, which is controlled by inhibitory neuronal activity, and pyramidal neuron uh, activity. So um, 
We've been studying a family of molecules called neuraglin or hyraglin, and this family of proteins is encoded by a single gene, but has uh, six different types, more than 30-some isoforms. Each of them would contain an uh, EGF domain, and most of them are diffusible, and they act on this ERB or HER receptor tyrosine kinases, two, three, and four. Uh, HER1 is classic EGFR. Okay, neuraglin doesn't bind to EGFR or ERB2. And neurag but the kinase activity per se, ERB3, is inactive. So ERB2 and 3 have to form a heterodimer to be effective. ERB4, however, can both bind to neuraglin and has an active kinase domain. And they thus can function as a heterodimer. So my lab has been trying to understand how you know, uh, this signaling pathway is regulated and what, it, what they do uh, in, um, in the brain. So uh, we and many have shown uh, that this signaling pathway is critical for the GABA circuit formation in the brain. That means it regulates interneural migration out of a ganglia eminent, populate the cortex, and forming axons and dendrites, uh, and the synapses as well. So this is the during development. So when you mutate your raglin or ERB4, and this whole thing will be messed up. But in the adult stage, both new raglin and ERB4 are highly expressed. In particular, this ERB4 is exclusively expressed in GABAergic neurons. GAT67 is a marker for uh, inhibitory uh, GABA neurons. And so uh, in the cortex and hippocampus, at least. OK, and we have shown uh, through many years that this signaling pathway is critical for EI balance, if you will. And so neuraglin is made primarily by pyramidal neurons in an activity-dependent manner. So it's more active, it produces more neuraglin, and neuraglin will bind to and activate ERB4, which I showed you mostly expressed in uh, inhibitory neurons, where it promotes GABA release. Okay? So if you inhibit or take out ERB4, inhibit this in the pathway, and this will lose inhibitory feedback, and thus it will fire like crazy. The mice may have epilepsy, and they have all kinds of problems in cognitive and uh, field conditioning, et cetera. OK, so and, and neuraglin and ERB4 are also risk genes of bipolar, major depression, schizophrenia, which is not surprising. So is ERB4 necessary? Yes. Well, so when you study non-mutant, which you take ERB4 out, the mice will make more errors, right? They make more errors, and uh, suggesting ERB4 is necessary. OK, so the problem right now, uh, uh, well, ERB4, when it's knocked out, uh, affects the synchrony as well. Okay? The synchrony is problematic when your ERB4 is knocked out. OK, so the problem is, I told you that the, that the, the neuraglin and ERB4 are critical for development. And I try to tell you now, the attention, top-down attention is an acute event and may be regulated by GABA. So is that the dynamic activity of ERB4, or is it due to you know, the, the, the circuit is not well built? So, and we cannot tell you, based on the data I just presented, the hippocampus is more important than anywhere else. So to address this question, we have to generate another mouse, which is so-called a chemical genetic mutant mouse. So this is based by Kevin Showcat's hypothesis, which dictates that the, all the kinases has a conserved ATP binding pocket. Okay, it has several key amino acid residues intrudes into the ATP binding pocket that they call gatekeepers. 
and if you can mutate them. So if, for example, if you mutate a bulky gatekeeper in that ATB binding pocket, you could enlarge that ATB binding pocket and thus allow access by a bulky inhibitor. Okay? So luckily for us, we identified ERB4 has this furin residue okay, as a gatekeeper. So we muted it, that. And as you can see, in the wire type, and if you add this bulk inhibitor, it would have no effect. It does, has no effect. And because the bulky inhibitor cannot fall into the regular ATP binding pocket. Now, when this is mutated, and you can see this bulk inhibitor can dose dependently suppress uh, ERB4 kinase activity. And this is reversible, and we made a Nagi mutant mice. And if you inject this bulk inhibitor in this mouse, you see this phosphorylation of ERB4 uh, decreased within. Uh, well, uh, 15 minutes, max about 30 minutes. Okay. Now, in this mutant mice, there's only one enzyme theoretically can be inhibited by this bulk inhibitor because others would not be accessible uh, by, by it. So this mouse, unlike normal mice, will have no whatsoever developmental phenotype. And when you test the behavior, and they are completely normal in learning, and so uh, in con this, is a, this is a wire type control mice, okay? So uh, the adding one and then PP1 would have no effect. And this is a mutant mice. This is a single amino acid mutant mice. And that shows the similar error ratio with the wire type mice and suggesting you know, they are completely normal until you give the one and then PP1. Make sense? And which actually shows that acute inhibition of ERB4 would have a problem. So, and we, if you cut the brain slices out and you are, and Zabin was able to demonstrate that in this mouse, not in wild type mouse, okay? So in wild type mice, you add one and then PP4, this GABA transmission would have no effect. Well, continuously to be normal. And, but in the mutant mice, if you add one and MPP4 and GABA release is compromised. Okay, so with this set up, now obviously you could see we could address uh, the critical questions we raised earlier. That is, we could inject one and MPP1 in hippocampus to specifically screw up ERB signaling pathway there. And we want to know, number one, whether the synchrony is changed. Number two, whether the top-down attention is changed. And the answer is yes. OK, so the synchrony is compromised when you inject one of the PP1, specifically in hippocampus. Okay? And the, the error ratio uh, is increased when ERB uh, when ERB4 in the hippocampus uh, is screwed up. Okay, so to summarize this, we demonstrated that the neuraglin and ERB4 are not only important for development, but it's dynamic activity or you know, active regulation of that. It's critical to control the EI balance. And when you acutely inhibit this, well, in hippocampus, not only <coughs> screw up uh, you know, working memory, et cetera, but also screw up uh, this attention, at least uh, in the story I just told you. And obviously, we believe the signaling pathway may, be, may contribute to pathologic mechanisms of schizophrenia and major depression. OK, so uh, I actually uh, want to uh, credit a few people. Uh, Wen Shang Swab uh, has long-term collaboration uh, with us. So, uh, Bob Lezak and Sokrat Zatos are physician scientists and recently joined by Mike Rufner in studies uh, anti-ARP4 and anti agarin antibodies in patients. Okay, Ronson Gene's lab and give us a lot of help in crystallizing agarin and ARP4. Fabo Su helped with the um, 
uh, Yisri Laige's uh, activity, Josh Gordon and Mimi Law helped with the brain studies. And we are very fortunate to have uh, various funding sources uh, uh, that support our work. And as G mentioned, Cleveland uh, has a lot of neuroscientists and, and uh, we try to uh, build up something and to accomplish otherwise uh, impossible to do. And that's Cleveland Brain Health Initiative. Thank you for your attention. Yes. Well, first of all, that's a fascinating thought. And I'm not sure how you were able to synchronize the, the instruction around you to make your point about, uh, uh, about distractions. Uh, that was very good. I've never seen that before in a visiting lecture. We'll have to have him back. That was good. So my question has to do with, um, in, the, in the normal population of mice, are there some mice that just do this better and some do it worse? And there, there are some genotypes that? Uh, yes. You know, in, this is, uh, you know, uh, Mo most people who study mouse behavior do not subgroup the mice, except for s uh, people uh, who study uh, depression. Right. Yeah. Eric Nessler and his colleagues in particular, so they, they actually would screen hundreds of mice and subgroup them into susceptible you know, resistant group or resilient group, they call it, and susceptible group. And in fact, they could find the differences among these two groups in terms of a gene expression and changes in their signaling pathway. Uh, most of people, unfortunately, cannot afford this type of a study, right? If you imagine, for us, for if in particular we want to subgroup herb for mutant mice, I would go bankrupt. Yeah. Okay. yeah, this is a very good point. But for other studies, um, people mostly don't do it. And that's why the behavior variation uh, is dramatic. And, but we, you know, we, we try to solve that or addressing that question by increasing the number of the mice we study. Which is, you know. You can see how you could, you could use that assay in the tools that you develop to answer a line of the questions, for example, post traumatic stress disorder. Yeah. And you can make that in a very model system. Questions? So I'm just wondering, you know, uh, in your first model that you mentioned, a single point mutation in LRP4, right, that causes a result signaling pathway that follows is through musk and that thing. So uh, I'm wondering, you know, would there be a way to correct this, if not at, you know, the mutation level, but by overexpressing musk or that, you know, that fine. As, as you mentioned, for the R4, it is reversible, right? Once you wash it out, it just fine. Uh, you are talking about congenital myasthenic syndrome patient, or you're talking about uh, myasthenia gravis? Myasthenia gravis, yeah, well, so the, the current study we are doing right now with the physicians is, in fact, at the moment, is trying to basically provide a better understanding whether these antibodies has any value in, well, certainly has value in diagnosis, but has any value in prognosis and in identifying a better treatment. Um, uh, you know, it's, it's a little bit more complex, but I could, I could tell you now, you know, the IRB is a huge issue for us. This is not a clinical trial, okay? We are not advising any of the physicians participating in this study in any way how to treat the patient. So the patients will be treated however way the doctor feels necessary. Then we collect the data and try to come up with something. So in some of the patients, in fact, in this group, has gone through so-called plasma exchange, and that certainly helped the patient. And 
from that plasma, we could identify ARP4 antibody. Okay. So uh, as far as you know, further therapeutic uh, you know, evaluation, I think it's ongoing. Yeah, and the second talk, could there be differences in expression level of your protein of interest with increased screen usage? I'm just thinking about all the different social media and things that we get attracted to. Could it change the expression level of the protein and make us more distracted from a biochemical standpoint from your This is a very good point, in fact. Um, uh, I, didn't, I did not get into detail, or well, thank you for the question. Um, so uh, most, most of so-called SNP or mutations have been identified in neuroglin 1 and RB4 are in non-coding region. Right? There are several, four in neuroglin 1, perhaps one or two in RB4 uh, in coding region. Uh, but we actually mutated, mutate them, and we cannot detect any biologic outcome of these mutations. But I mean, I mean more of a uh, adaptive change in expression of the protein because of. Oh, because of behavior. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely, definitely. Um, c certainly, in phosphorylation level. Okay. Uh, some behavioral paradigm could increase RB4 on your regulin level. But I wouldn't say that's a specific increase. You know, if you measure other trophy factors, such as BDNF, probably increase in almost any behavioral paradigm you could imagine. But that is very difficult to, you know, to claim that's a cause. Thank you. Any other questions? So that experiment actually is very label intensive. The training any mouse for five choice takes about at least one month, if not longer, sometimes 40 some <laughs> days. For one mouse, okay, in, and and then after training, you implant the electrodes. That takes about uh, several several weeks to recover, and then sometimes you have to refresh the memory and then start this uh, clinical trial. So that whole, if everything works out perfectly, you might some you might see some data within two months, and that's not counting. You have to accumulate little mates of the same uh, genotype, same genetic background, et cetera. <coughs> yes. <coughs> I had a miss uh, uh, some of your points. So ERB4 is a uh, tarsin kinase, and it al already has a short time uh, mm -hmm. And when was, did, did, have you met the protein side of that medium? Mm -hmm. this, this I mean, it's a target substance. Yes. Is that yes. what, what do you mean by functional substance? So you already mentioned that uh, the, where the phosphate group goes to the substrate that mediates this something. Yeah, the uh, RB4, yeah. RB4, yeah. RB4. Uh -huh. so what we know in the brain is specifically expressed in interneurons. So cellular, we know it's there. But the signaling pathway, how it contributes to or regulate neural migration or GABA release, it's not known. We, some, we have some hypothesis. In fact, we are using Kevin Shokat's, uh, you know, bulky ATP, thio ATP, trying as we speak. The, uh, identify the exactly what RB4 phosphorylates. Is that what you mean? Yeah. yeah. So that's what we're doing right now. Yeah. And also, uh, maybe a more general question. Uh, neuro, the signal, I, I'm not a neuro, neuro, 
some of the phenomena are always quite about, for example, attention. You can sleep in three or seven. But in terms of vacancy, for example, the thoughts of attraction, how you achieve this, this kind of kinetics, it's always uh, part of the vacancy. <laughs> This is, uh, if anyone can solve this question, for sure it will be several Nobel Prizes, not just one. Um, so I could tell you the current hypothesis. So the current hypothesis possibly is due to limited approach, which is, which is the learning and encoding of the memory may be extremely different from how you recall. So the recall, possibly, as you said, it's a split of a second. But encoding and where to store the memory is, you know, that's all we know, right? You mutate a gene, you see the learning memory has a problem. But recall. Nobody has any clue. We all know it's a split of a second. You see something, all of a sudden you recall your first day in the primary school. It cannot be phosphorylation change. But exactly what it is, I, I cannot. I don't think anyone can tell you. OK, thank you. Thank you.